morning, everybody. My name is Lee Dupree. I'm the Managing Director of BE Innovation. We're a BE and transformation consultancy, and we work with our clients to handhold and build a BE process. Um, we've got a, a really good and interesting panel for you today. We're going to be talking about uh, a very important issue. Um, obviously, all being from business, we need to ensure that we're able to um, look after our, uh, our teams and our employees um, so that uh, they're protected uh, in this new world that we all live in now, um, uh, which is a function of the COVID-19 um, viral pandemic that we're all facing. Right. So um, thank you for joining me. Thank you for joining us. Um, I'm going to uh, just uh, please note, I will ask that um, anybody who's interested in keeping up with our webinars in the future, um, please feel free to uh, sign up for our newsletter on our website. This is the first in a series uh, on another very interesting um, topic that we'll be discussing in the future. So um, I will uh, let me introduce you to our moderator today. Her name is Melanie Vaness. She's the CEO of the Peter Maritzburg and Midlands Chamber of um, Business. And she'll be running the session today. Let's keep it interactive. We'll have a few poll questions that we'll put out. If you're following us live or streaming on our Facebook channel, then please post your questions on Facebook and we will pass them on to uh, our moderator as well. Um, so with that, I'm going to hand you over to Melanie. She'll, she'll run the rest of the session. We're going on for an hour, so please do engage with us and feel free to ask any questions you might have. So Melanie, over to you. Thank you so much, Lee. Good morning, everybody, um, and good morning to our panelists. Um, I've already had an introduction, so I'm going to ask if our two panelists wouldn't mind just taking a couple of minutes to introduce themselves. Perhaps uh, um, Bongi, and Kus uh, Bongi can ask you, Bongi Mshengu, who's the uh, current president of the chamber, uh, to just tell us a little bit about himself. Uh, thanks, Melanie. Good morning, everybody. Um, my name is Bongi Mshengu. Uh, I'm a full-time human resources consultant. Um, in placement, training, and facilitation. I specialize in performance management and also do employment equity. Um, as Melania said, I'm currently the, the president of Peter Marisberg and Midlands uh, Chamber of Business. Um, I have uh, quite a wide experience in the area of uh, human resources, having spent quite a lot of time in private and public sector for many, many years. Um, which I enjoyed very much. I'm committed to the empowerment of uh, staff and transformation of the workplace. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Thanks so much, Bongi. And um, Nigel, if I could ask you, please, to introduce yourself. Hi there. Thank you, Melanie. Good morning to all the panelists. My name is Nigel Michaels. I am a full-time consultant in the development and implementation of management systems that includes the 45,001 in the health and safety sector and environmental. Um, over and above that, I carry out trainings uh, specifically in the automotive, um, of, it's the field as well. So thank you. And um, yeah, thank you, Melanie, if I can move on to yourself. Absolutely. So uh, here we sit in, in unprecedented times. Uh, I think if six months ago, someone had said to you, uh, uh, during March, the entire world practically would shut down, that everybody would be confined to their homes, that we would be uh, dealing with a pandemic of this proportion, um, and that 2020 would look like this. I don't think anybody would have believed us. So here we find ourselves in the midst of this and, uh, and uh, desperately trying to balance economic needs and health needs um, of our people. And, uh, and business is going to start going back from next week. And we need to make sure that we have adequately uh, prepared our workplaces um, and that we do everything in our power to ensure that um, our workers are as protected as they possibly can be. And there were a lot of questions around that um, from business, uh, particularly because uh, they're saying, you know, what, what are the regulations? What will we be required to do uh, and to what extent? 
So um, Nigel, the Occupational Health and Safety Act, uh, if you read it with the hazardous bi biological agents regs and the environmental regulations for workplaces, they say that um, <coughs> employers have to provide and maintain a working environment that is safe and without risks to the health of employees and to take reasonable steps um, to eliminate or mitigate the hazard or potential hazard. Um, we haven't faced anything like COVID-19. What does that mean for the workplace? Um, it means for the workplace to identify those hazards that they would encounter, and that was pre-COVID. Pre um, and um, essentially it boils down to really a risk assessment um, that would manifest those hazards in, in, in the workplace and identifying those, it's, 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 it's the hazards. And it's more a preemptive exercise, a proactive exercise, and it's a dynamic as we start to ex um, experience uh, this, this ex event as well. And I see it has been gazetted with regards to now having a specific localized, it's, it's a risk assessment in assessing those hazards pertaining to the transmissions um, and the because of the highly contagious, um, it's the disease with regards to addressing um, the preemptive measures that we've now put in place. We've um, been inundated with a deluge of, of, of information in, in actually minimizing it. It's, it's the risk and it's well known. Um, however, it will really be tested once we all engage and start going back into work. And it's really um, evaluating those controls or those measures that have now been put in place to ensure they are really sustainable. Um, and that is the adaptability and the robustness that we need to ensure that we have in, in, in our, our risk assessment. So the question is, you know, I'm going to go back to work next week. I'm going to have my workers there. Um, there's been a lot in the news around um, unions insisting that uh, various workplaces test their employees. Um, now, it's my understanding that there is a worldwide shortage of tests that um, only a small percentage of their tests make them their way to South Africa, that the bulk of them go to, uh, to government and the balance of those to private labs, um, the, the minimum um, kind of uh, cost that one could face as, as an organization would be around 850 Rand per person. Um, and that's quite a cost for an organization uh, to have to cover. Um, is this something that organizations will be prepared to, uh, to actually undertake to do? Um, should they be expected to carry that cost? Bearing in mind they've just come out of a, a situation where they've made no income, um, and uh, they're in they're in dire in a dire position and uh, financially. Just your comment on that? Um, yeah, it's a it it is a um, it, it it is a tricky scenario that we actually find ourselves just 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 actually recognise that this is an extraordinary um, event. Um, I think industry has come to the fore um, with regards to at least creating a little bit of a control with regards to, to, um, with regards to mitigating the effects. Um, and um, those controls need to be better done, which I would imagine they are embarking on it as we, as we speak now. Um, so it's the social distancing, it's the, it's the precautionary principle that we, that we need to bring across that we don't always need a scientific expertise before we actually actually recognize that just having a, a, a normal two-layered face mask um, to, uh, to actually recognize that it's, it's the mitigating it, it would be, it would be the effects. It also uh, actually brings about to um, um, possibly re, uh, reinvigorate the um, suggestion poll because it's everybody collaborating together and um, coming up with um, solutions with regards to how we're going to um, ensure that the mitigation, its, its effects would be, would be managed. Uh, with regards to testing, um, there, are, there are mechanisms now in, that are actually rolling out and are actually getting in place. It is getting better. Um, 
but yes, um, it's about um, collaboration with all members in, in an organization to ensure that we can, um, and, and the benefit of, with regards to, it would be this process, it would really challenge our um, innovation, which I, I think it has. Um, and um, to, to actually really um, allow that, um, that these challenges get, it would be disseminated down to an employee level um, to ensure that we can find, find um, a joint solution because it's not um, a, a management problem or, or, or a company problem. It's all, all our problems jointly that we can solve together. Yeah, I think you, you're absolutely right. It's going to be a collaborative effort. I'm just looking at uh, poll results that came in to the question, have you started implementing the COVID-19 direction on health and safety in the workplace? 56% said yes and 44% uh, said no, just from feedback on that poll. Um, I think the difficulty is, is, is getting some sort of direction. Uh, Bongi, from, from a, an HR perspective, what would be the approach if, if there was an expectation that came from the workforce that people should be tested, um, bearing in mind that there's a shortage of tests and that when we ultimately need to use them to test for positive cases, we might have used them all up just testing people in, in organizations. Is it something that you feel that organizations uh, should undertake um, and, and who should pay for that expense? Yeah, thank, thank you, Melin. I think I think probably the the first thing one would need to uh, advise employers on um, is to take the employees along in terms of dealing with this uh, mammoth uh, problems that we are problem that we are facing as a country and the world, so that the issues that are raised uh, require joint solutions. I think Nigel has touched upon this one as well. Joint solution between management and and staff, in terms of uh, what is possible and what is immediately possible, and what are the long-term issues. This would probably entail revisiting you know, your, your, your policies and also how these policies would be implemented in the, in the context of the COVID-19. I think certainly from my side, I think the, the issue of screening is going to be quite crucial in terms of ensuring that the workplace is protected all the time, probably on a daily basis. Um, the, 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 the testing thereof for those people who are identified to be possibly, uh, you know, have the virus, would have to be discussed in terms of the budgets and whether we can refer those, uh, some of those in terms of each industry uh, into the government facilities. But if we can, as, in, as, as, as employers, I think we need to try as much as possible in terms of assisting our employees because it's for the interest of business and the society at large. But the, 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 uh, I, I want to underscore the issue of really taking everybody along with you, uh, be they just workers or uh, worker representatives, so that we know we have uh, win the hearts and minds of, of everybody in the, in the workplace and work towards the same direction in terms of finding solutions. Thank you. Right. I, one of the things that, that I'm wondering about is when I mean, we recently had one of our, our manufacturers that did test their entire workforce and and had two people come up positive that were both asymptomatic they showed no elevated temperatures no signs they themselves had no idea they actually had it uh, so the random uh, the testing across the workforce actually um, alerted the company to the fact that they had positive people and that they needed to take action in terms of uh, quarantining and sanitizing and uh, giving the information so that the Department of Health could follow the contacts. Um, you know, I think as, a, as an ordinary business, if, if you can't afford to test anybody, and I don't know that it's necessarily wise in the context of the shortage of, of tests, um, you know, one could put I guess you've got to just put reasonable uh, controls in place and, and, and temperature controls are, are, are one of those things, temperature testing, but, it's, but it really doesn't catch everybody in the net. Um, what will you say the, the preventative measures, the reasonable uh, measures to put in place that companies will have to put in place um, come opening? Uh, I think I think the 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 issues that, or the first issue, of course, the, the workplace must be uh, properly sanitized, cleaned up, and also the the, the very basic protective uh, PPE, your 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 mask, um, 
your 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 your, your water stations and uh, the, the soap and uh, you know employees have got to be trained have got to be uh, really uh, given inf enough information in terms of how on their part they can play a role in terms of preventing uh, getting the disease itself i think they as employers would need to make sure that we go out there firstly make sure that the the, the masks are available which which are the basics in my view and also the workplace is, ad is adequately uh, you know have have adequate facilities in terms of making sure that hygiene standards are held um, you know as much as it is possible i think i think the 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 the, the other issue of course is that in terms of your your leadership your uh, work and safe, i mean health and safety committees you identify individuals that would really be assisting management in terms of identifying hazardous issues and issues that really are going to make making sure that we improve in terms of our standards and protecting people. Of course, there, there would be those who are, who are asymptomatic that as, 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 as an organization, uh, when, as, as and when we find out that they are exhibiting those symptoms, are uh, either referred outside, or if we have got facilities internally that, that, held, uh, that dealt with in terms of our own clinics. But I think, I think we, 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 need, we need to enroll uh, you know, uh, you know, as much as possible, the leadership in, internally in terms of staff, certainly your, 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 your uh, health and safety committees, so that they assist management in dealing with these matters and, and really engage staff on an ongoing basis, uh, identifying things that they should be doing on their part. Fantastic. Now, one of the things that has come out quite strongly from what from both of you are saying um, is the importance of communication. Uh, Nigel, what what sort of forms would communication take uh, in this instance? Would you need to put pamphlets out? Would you need to talk regularly? Would you need to point people? How, how will you deal with the, the communication? Um, it, it would start off with an awareness campaign with, man, with top management um, and training. Um, but it alludes us to the hierarchy of controls. The, um, it's, the, it's the elimination, substitution, engineering controls, administrative, and then the lowest on the hierarchy is PPE. Um, essentially, that is the easiest that we can, we, we can actually adopt from a, from a symptomatic and, a, and addressing it as, as a quick fix. But it's those engineering controls that we can move up towards. <laughs> challenging those um, unique working activities that we can address and localize um, our mitigations and measures that we can now adequately put in place. Um, administrative controls, which you've just mentioned to answer your question right now, would be with regards to a risk assessment, which is classified as a hazards, identifying it's the hazards or the hazardous areas or the localized areas in the workplace. And, and the risks associated from a high and a low with regards to how we would, we would address that. And what that essentially does from an administrative control, it, localize, it, it essentially prioritizes and it prioritizes the effort that, that an organization could, um, could, could actually address. And it becomes a dynamic record. It's not a, a actually record that actually sits in a file. It's essentially um, it's classified as a, um, uh, it's a hazard identification, um, 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 it, it's a regulation, it, it, would be, it would be an assessment that would be carried out on, on the shop floor that is owned by the owners and there's a collaborative effort that they would understand what are the risks associated with their unique areas. Yes, we've got a generic form with regards to understanding it's the, it's the very, it's, it's the layout, but here we're talking about now adapting it to the readiness in the workplace environment, because essentially what it boils down to is continuity in, in the workplace. Okay, Sepu, so we've had a question, um, and Boggy, I'm going to, uh, I'm going to ask you if you wouldn't mind answering this. Um, so if you're allowed in terms of the legislation to resume work, and um, are you allowed to insist that your employees come in and start work? Uh, what of the area around, um, you know, the, the, the level four uh, talks about uh, pre-existing pre conditions or conditions that make people more vulnerable to, to getting this um, COVID-19. Um, 
what do you do in circumstances uh, where people do have underlying conditions, hypertension, or uh, might be HIV positive, or um, have autoimmune conditions, or uh, the tricky one, be over the age of 60? Um, can you insist that they come to work? What if they want to come to work, even though they have underlying conditions? What, what, what do you do in those circumstances? Yeah, probably, firstly, firstly, I need to say, in terms of the, the contract of employment, um, employers are, are entitled to require employees to resume work. That's one. But secondly, uh, the issue of, uh, in terms of the, of the Health and Safety Act, I think when employees believe that there is a high risk in the workplace, um, they need to point out to the employer. Of course, the employer, until such time he addresses those issues that have been raised, he cannot really, in terms of the, in terms of the act itself, uh, be able to uh, uh, fire the employees as it were. But I think, I think the, the, the issue of the, uh, uh, the over 60s, uh, as, 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 as defined in terms of uh, the, the guidelines, I think as employers, I would advise that employers be sensitive in terms of uh, uh, those employees, of course, uh, assessing the, the each individual employee in terms of uh, the condition that the, uh, has been highlighted. For instance, if an employee is known, has been taking sick leave all along, has got a known very, uh, 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 you know, uh, a disease that is really very, very serious, the employer needs to sensitively look at that. Whether, whether that employee for the period of time can be given time off, of course it will be leave without pay uh, if it doesn't have any leave due to him. But uh, the sensitivity thereof, I think I would advise employ employers to look at that. Um, the challenge would be in terms of who actually, who else does the work because then the employer runs short of, uh, of skills in the workplace. We'd have to really juggle things around. Uh, for the period, a specific period of time, which in my view may be two months, three months, or whatever time it is. Um, I guess what I'm saying, A, the employer is entitled to insist that employees come back to work in terms of the contract, employment contract. But if employees believe that there is, a, they, 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 there is a danger in them coming back, or a specific employee because of the situation in the workplace, those situations have got to be investigated and really taken care of. And thirdly, there needs to be some sensitivity in terms of sick employees, older employees, for the period of the uh, of, of COVID nineteen. Thank you. Thank you. Um, this area, particularly, I think we we are have the highest HIV infection rates in the world. So a lot of uh, significant portion of workforces. Um, you will find HIV positive uh, people and a lot of people that are have TB and once you add up those things plus the hypertension plus the other underlying conditions that, that could actually land up being a significant portion of your of your workforce. Um, what would you advise uh, employers in those circumstances? I think I think the um, those situations the employer needs to treat uh, on a case by case on a case by case basis. Um, I understand that if in HIV positive employees, those who have been on uh, treatment, who have never defaulted on treatment, are probably in a, even in a better condition to really withstand uh, the possibility of contracting uh, COVID nineteen the, the virus, as it were. Of course, if they they, they observe. Uh, the hygiene standards and wear masks and all those things. I think as employers, I don't think we can on a blanket basis uh, excuse everybody with uh, a, a chronic disease as it were, unless if we have uh, identified specific individuals who are, at, who are at a very, very serious levels and really deal with those on an individual basis. Because if we did that, uh, our situation really would, won't be able to run factories and won't be able to, to, uh, to make sure that our businesses go forward. And therefore, on, a, on, a, on an individual basis, the, those assessments have got to be done and decisions taken on that basis. Fantastic. Uh, Nigel, um, in the workplace now, one's got to put in place protocol for uh, social distancing. What would you consider to be 
uh, reasonable? Is there a guideline that tells us what is reasonable? Is there a guideline that tells us exactly what it is that we have to put in place to ensure the safety of our workers? Uh, yes, there is. Um, it was a gazetted, uh, it's, I see it's been up, updated. Um, it's the, um, it's the COVID-19 occupational health and safety and it's the returning back to work and, 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 and the readiness. And it speaks about the 1.5 meter. However, it says if it's not practical um, to identify a certain barriers that one could incorporate. However, going back to the precautionary principle where we can have markers and actually adopt the walkways um, and that could, that could um, um, actually reach a happy medium with regards to, to the costing of, of that as, as well. Um, it, also, it also boils down to, to personnel's behavior um, because we understand again um, that it's, it's, the, it's the routines, it's, it's the disciplines that we actually are addressing it, not just for because it's a rule, um, it's, 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 it's a, it, essentially, it, it essentially affects us all. So, um, so to answer your question, it's, um, it's 1.5 meters um, with regards to social distancing um, in, in the workplace. And I understand it's probably going to be, and, the, and this is only going to be recognized and um, really tested when, once we get in, into the workplace and seeing that there are going to be some challenges that we would need to overcome. Thank you. And then other forms of forms of PPE that you have to put in place. Uh, what specifically would you have to put in place? And is there a, a kind of a spec on the masks that you make available? And how many do you have to make available? And what kind? Um, how do people know that they're buying the right stuff? Um, um, I do know, and I've sent the advert out. Um, there are there are organisations that have now steered in in the direction with regards to um, supporting a a face mask that actually meets to 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 the regulations with regards to a two 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 layered um, um, to ensure that the it's the particulate is able to um, at least to um, would be to mitigate the um it's the it's the COVID affection um especially if um if an individual had to come in with the if and be a, and be affected um it, it, it essentially doesn't entirely have the um the overall mitigation but it has has um some so there are there are companies out there that are actually making these um it's the it's it's the equipment with the to sanitizing tunnels and face mask. And one of them, if I may mention the name, uh, is Ramsey Engineering. Um, and I have sent the um, advert out to the BE Innovation. Um, so they've embarked on actually making, um, it's a tailor-made um, face mask and, um, and a woven face mask, which is suitable for the, for the, for the workplace. However, uh, should there be, um, they speak about an FFP, um, and it's a FFP1 surgical face mask, and that is in the event that um, um, that they've identified or someone has now um, basically brought it up to their their own attention and their supervisor's attention that they are now showing a little bit of symptoms. Um, so they would basically that would be a mask that they would use. To ensure that they, there's an element of mobility and they could um, it's essentially adopt the it's the quarantine measures and actually put those in place. Okay, so you're saying essentially that, that people would have to have two types of masks: masks for their workforce that are two two level two ply cotton masks, and that they would have to then have these additional uh, proper surgical masks uh, to deal with positive cases. So, so somebody tells their supervisor on the line, um, I'm not feeling well, I, uh, I have kind of flu-like symptoms, what do we do? What, what is the process then? What, what, how do you immediately react? What do you do? Okay, I'm gonna read off exactly uh, what it's um, actually mentioned in the, um, it's the measures in, in the workplace that was gazetted, um, updated last night. So uh, with regards to work uh, the worker is, a read, is ready at, at the workplace. Um, isolate the worker, provide the worker, which is, is indicated in FF, FFP1 surgical mask and arrange for the worker to be transported 
in a manner that does not place the other worker or member of the, at the public at risk um, and assess the risk of transmission and disinfect the area, which I'm sure um, the companies are now really up to speed with regards to the other precautionary measures that they would, that they would have to take. So essentially they would need from the, um, actually possibly in the first aid station or in, 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 in their clinics, possibly obtain because it is a quite a specific and a prescribed criteria with regards to a, this type of specific mask in the event of. Um, and it's a, precautionary, it's a precautionary measure, but just understand uh, PPE is weighted on, and I'm gonna go back to it with regards to what is weighted from a, a it's a risk assessment, and I think it's correctly worded in the, in, in, in the, in the, in the directive here. Um, that the appropriate PP has got to be weighted against the it's the type of hazard and and the chance or the likelihood that that um, actually risk or transmission can occur. Just understand that prior to the work, and I understand we actually might get those isolated cases where they're asymptomatic. Um, they've been um, hand washing every ten minutes. Um, with regards to their um, actually workplace activities, there's a staggered shift. There's 1.5 meter apart. There's um, a temperature scanning. One would think that that um, is, is a mitigation in itself would be sufficient. Um, so, so the likelihood of those protocols now being in place uh, should that slip through the cracks and identify a individual with, um, that needs to be isolated uh, one would think that um, those protocols, if they could step in, in, in place and adopt the, it's the required PPE, um, that the effects are able to be, are able to be manageable. So a lot of this stuff sounds a, a little bit cryptic. Um, forgive me saying that business people are very practical people. So we're saying transport this person in a manner where it can't affect anybody else. How do you reasonably do that? I mean, if you're a, a normal business, you would need to transport them in a car and somebody would have to take them. So, so, so what does that actually mean? Um, yeah, it's, a, it's, a, it's an interesting question and um, to be honest with you, it's only by adopting and to be authentic about it, it's only by having those experiences. Um, so yes, it's gloves, it's, um, it's basically re actually reporting to the, to the clinic, getting the advice, uh, um, training our first, our first responders, which is our first first responders, um, and um, yeah, it's, it's taking the necessary precautions in, in the moment in, in, in time, uh, you know, rather, rather have something that's, that's rather known and, and, and taking some precaution um, and, and addressing it from a, from a yeah, reactive basis, un, un, unfortunately. Um, but it's knowing that those, it's the strict are in place, but it's also getting to a place of self actually realization where, um, just remember, this is not just um, uh, for shop floor personnel disease. This is for everybody around the sectors. So it's 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 personnel to actually recognise that um, um, to to have a little bit of a self awareness to actually recognise. Hang on, I'm feeling well. I shouldn't be going. I should be going home. And but let me report to my supervisor. Um, so it's keeping those records. It's um, it's it's open communication. Um, and uh, and and that's what it, it emphasizes in our in in, in our directions here. So um, to answer that question fully, I, I think we've taken preemptive measures. But once it's and only in the test space where we really understand um, how the it's it's the it's the effectiveness of those controls would would essentially be. Thank you. Um, Bongi, if I can ask you a question. We, we, we all have experienced people uh, during our time of managing organizations that, um, that uh, like to um, stay at home quite a lot and, uh, and then could step up and say, well, I, I feel a little bit flu-y. I don't think that this should be uh, risking the whole organization. I think I'd better go home. What do you do with uh, people that habitually uh, abuse sick leave in these kind of circumstances and how do you tell whether they really do have relaxed symptoms or whether they don't? 
I think I think I think basically um, the, the the issue of testing or screening of screening in the workplace has got to happen all the time. Um, I think in terms of the guidelines, they've given us indication in terms of if a person has got one, two, three, four, is likely to probably um, need uh, testing regarding COVID. But uh, issues like flus, ordinary flus, which still happen, we're getting into winter season. In fact, uh, flus are still going to happen in the normal way. I think our occupational health uh, clinics or nurses would have to really look at that and say, in terms of the guidelines, this person might require um, to, be, to be tested and therefore we take this direction. If a person is, 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 has got flu, that renders him or her uh, unable to perform work. Of course, in the normal course of events, the sick leave issue uh, you know, would have to be authorized either through the company doctor or the person taking those first two days and seeing the doctor thereafter if he's not, he or she is not getting better. I don't think we need to we need to really deviate from the normal way we have handled the flu cases unless if in terms of the guidelines there are additional things that point to the possibility of the of the disease uh, of, of the need to test for the disease and therefore employers would have to really be careful in terms there's a very fine line between the two I understand but uh, specifically the, the 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 guidelines have got to be looked at and uh, you know, occupational health people will have to assist us really to say, yes, we go for testing, or yes, you go home and recover and take medication in terms of the normal flu. Okay, I would imagine it would be quite difficult to tell the difference. Uh, so that is gonna be a tricky space with us heading into winter. Um, just in terms of PPE, uh, Nigel, are, are companies obliged to supply it for their employees? I mean, there is a part of the communication from the presidency was that nobody is allowed to leave their house without a mask. So can they be, um, can they be made to buy their own masks if they're a small business? Uh, can they ask their employees to buy their own? Uh, or can they be charged for the mask the company uh, gets on their behalf? This was actually a question that came through the, the Q&A. Um, it is the obligation of the company um, where it, and it, this is how it words it, where necessary, supply the employees free of charge with the appropriate PP based on the risk assessment of the working place. So that, that obligation lies with the employer. Fantastic. Uh, Bongi, if I can ask you a question about transport. So there's been a lot of uh, discussion about the risks of public transport, um, of people um, perhaps um, needing to be given company assisted transport or special kind of protection or some kind of intervention. Uh, is there any obligation or is there anything that the company should be doing to ensure the safety of their workers uh, traveling to work? In terms, of, in terms of transport, currently there are some, some employers providing transport, <clears throat> which I think uh, then we should continue doing. Of course, with the, with the understanding that uh, in terms of those numbers, we need to make sure that social distancing is observed. But uh, the, the, the general provision of transport where it has not been provided for, I think it would be the, dis the discretion of, of the employer, but I think there's no, there's no uh, requirement as such that the employers of necessity should really be, uh, uh, you know, incurring additional expenses regarding transport. But uh, to assist employees where transport is not available or where transport in this instance would uh, put them in danger, uh, employers would need to look at how those things are done. Uh, not necessarily as, 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 as a condition of service as, as such, but uh, to ameliorate the, 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 the situation that employees find themselves in. Uh, I, I, would say, I, I would say where it is practicable, uh, where it is possible, uh, even if employees are going to be paying for it, employers can organize transport uh, where it is possible, but not as a, as a, as a condition of service as such. <clears throat> Okay, thank you. Um, Nigel, I'm going to go back to you. Um, in the beginning of our engagement, you spoke about the need to conduct a risk assessment in the workplace. Is there a particular points under that heading that people have to, to, to have a look at? I mean, so we've spoken about a lot of things. We've said, have a look at the environment and identify where they are potentially places 
instances where there could be risk, like for instance, people that engage with the public, um, people that sit too close together, people that uh, have underlying conditions. There's all these different things. So, so my question is, what would you include in this risk assessment, um, especially for small businesses? How, how, how do they, I mean, they're not necessarily going to be able to afford a professional. Would they be able to do it on their own or would they have to uh, get somebody to come and help them? Or is there a template or is there some kind of uh, thing they can download that gives them advice? Uh, what do they do? Um, it makes it quite clear with regards to 500, uh, one's got to have a risk assessment that's got to be submitted to the department of, um, it's, it's, it's the labor in, uh, and, and that would be accompanied with their, with their policy. Um, over and amongst that, with regards to 10 employees, they would also need to carry out a risk assessment under section 40 uh, with regards to the, it's the directions in, in the workplace. With regards to templates, they can contact myself directly. I will gladly send them out a, um, a, a partly furnished template and engage with the client to ensure that they can actually make a little bit of a steady path towards the right direction in, in line with what, what the legislation actually requires. Um, but there would be those uh, unique working activities that once they've got the little bit of a know-how that they would need to go and evaluate and, and observe. And they would identify the it's the hazardous um, situations and 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 the risks imposed and the controls that they would need to to actually put in place. Okay, so step one is do this risk assessment. Is there a time limit in terms of when it has to be submitted and a, and a method to submit it? Um, essentially, um, how, how surprised does one really have to be? Um, so that is really the waiting question with regards to, um, it's, it's the management of your, of your organization. So one would think that you've made some strides already. Um, I would suggest that yes, we've got this preemptive and this proactive, but it's only in the, it's only in the test conditions that when we now adapt it, to the actual workforce and the social distancing and the behaviors and the social impact that it's going to impose, that we're really going to see the robustness start to manifest. Um, so essentially, the quicker we can start with that risk assessment, um, the, it's the better that we can see the little bit of a path and a little bit further down the road and it's having a little bit of um, you know, line of sight with regards to how we, how we pivot because um, these are changing circumstances and, and, and it allows us to be in a position of actually strength to, um, to engage with these, um, it, would be, it would be the changes that we, that we are actually faced with. Um, okay, so one has to put together this risk assessment and we can use the template and we can, and, and it's then a, it's a moving target because you're learning all the time and it's adapting and That's changing correct. new stuff in place. But you mentioned earlier that you, that you have to submit it to, to the Department of Labor at some point. Uh, how do you submit it and is there a deadline date by which to submit it? And if you change it, how do you change it with this after the submission? Um, I'm just going to have a look um, and make sure that I've got my... So essentially, um, with regards to risk assessment, so it's employees 500 or more, um, and it's the, it's the health and safety committee meeting. Um, so you would get the, it's the committee involved um, in conjunction with the Department of Labor. So this is commencing work. Just, just remember that a, 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 it would be a risk assessment is a dynamic record. So it's continuously up, updating and reevaluating, um, and it needs to be revisited possibly daily um, on certain areas. So it's identifying those areas of risk and prioritizing your risk um, and where you've put in mitigations that you can move down and you know, depending on how it's been weighted. So essentially, um, it's prior to starting work um, that they would submit to the, to the Department of Labor and engage with the health and safety committee meetings, um, with the health and safety committee, sorry. Uh, super, that's helped us a little bit. Uh, we had a, a poll a little bit earlier. Um, perhaps we could see the results of that poll. 
um, now. So Paul was, are you aware of hazardous biological agent regulations governing workplaces in relation to the coronavirus disease 2019 caused by SARS? Um, only 8% said yes, and most people said no. Okay. So um, interesting. It's a regulation that has been in place for, for quite some time. It also speaks about, and I'm going to harp on it, because that's the administrative control, and essentially that's where the planning starts coming into into effect and it also weights up the cost and 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 a risk assessment is a lot more than just um, proactively and reactively it also comes with its um, opportunities and it, it essentially pushes the boundaries of of um, companies that have a maturity of understanding the risk assessments and understanding those those unknowns um, and they can reap the benefits with regards to pushing the boundaries of enhancing their their ability in um, innovation, um, because it's all about the um, it, it's the continuity of operations. Great, thank you for that, um, Bongi. Um, just from a practical point of view, um, how would organisations um, put? protocol in place for, for people that uh, call in like contractors or outside services that, that come in to, to service your organization. Um, there might be delivery people or, or contractors or people coming on site. Um, what is reasonable for companies to, to put in place and, um, and expect from, from those support services? Yeah, I think <clears throat> I, I think I think the situation calls for revisiting the contracts that we have, um, be they with the service providers or contractors, uh, which requires that they have to behave in a certain way whilst in our company pro uh, property or in the workplace. In this instance as well, I think I think the uh, contracts that business has with uh, the uh, people who deliver have got to be relooked at in terms of including uh, the, uh, the guidelines of the COVID-19. Uh, for instance, uh, people who uh, come to deliver must uh, wear correct PPE, uh, must uh, have done the, uh, the screenings, um, you know, must go through the screenings and must really comply with whatever, you know, arrangements we have in, the, in, the, in, 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 in our workplace. And therefore, we would need to be in sync with the, uh, with the, with the organizations that we work with and insist that uh, everybody else complies with the regulations and complies with the guidelines um, if we are going to be continuing doing business with them. And normally, normally that's what happens if uh, you have co contractors working in your workplace. There are guidelines and agreements that are put in place which uh, are discussed between the parties and which have got to be complied with. I think we would need to continue doing that, including the issues of, of COVID-19. Uh, so that everybody else is on the same page regarding the implementation. Thank you so much. Um, a question for, for you, Nigel, um, just from a practical point of view that came off the Q&A. Um, uh, when you get to work in an office environment, must you wait for some sort of clearance before you go to your desk or do you just go straight to your desk and then wait to be cleared later? And is there documentation that needs to be filled out? Do you have to have a, a document that says you're cleared to work for the day? Uh, or a register, or what would you put in place for that? Um, essentially, prior to a company commencing, and this I understand is um, some of the automotive companies, they're spending at least a week just preparing those protocols, preparing the workplace. So essentially, it would start with induction training um, that they would be in. Um, so once they've gone through that, in, that induction process, uh, the protocols will then be set with regards to how they would come into work. That would be communicated. Um, and that's really the level of what we want to achieve here is the level of communication has got to go from top up and actually bottom down. It's got to disseminate right down to key, uh, key, key and all, all workers and actually personnel within the workplace. So right from um, a symptom screening to uh, wearing gloves, um, ensuring that the workplace is um, clean. Um, but those would be covered in, in the induction training. So essentially an induction training prior to, to, to um, a commencing work. Okay, so 
every organization, regardless of, si of size, has got to have some kind of induction and some kind of policy in place that everybody understands how it works and everybody follows it um, to ensure the safety of people. So, Bongi, a, a question for you. If, if you've got this policy and protocol in place and somebody doesn't do what they're supposed to do, so somebody sneezes without sneezing into a cloth that can be disposed of in the workplace, what do you do in those circumstances? Would they face disciplinary action? And do you have to adjust your, your, your disciplinary code to include uh, contravention of, the, of, of these particular uh, requirements in terms of your, your policy related to COVID-19? I think, I think the, our current situation does not absolve anybody from complying with, uh, with the policies of the organization that are there. Of course, as I said earlier on, um, it's, it's a, we are going through challenging times that we would need to revisit all the policies and see if they're at the level that uh, take into account our current situation in terms of the disease. Of course, uh, if a person breaks the rule, this is it where there's a misconduct in the workplace, uh, our normal disciplinary process have got to be looked at and, and applied. Um, of course, uh, one would need to really assess in each case whether it was deliberate or not and take appropriate action uh, regarding that particular employee because then we cannot allow uh, people in the workplace or anywhere else to endanger the lives of others uh, through carelessness and really uh, probably even de deliberate disregard of the policies. What I'm saying, the, the policies would still stand, would, would still be there and would have to be applied albeit in terms of uh, being uh, moderated where there is a need to moderate them to take into account our current situation. Thank you. Um, I think we could uh, have our last poll now since we're nearing the end of our session. Um, so how would you rate your knowledge of legal requirements to comply with government's COVID-19 requirements or legislation? Um, there's four options there if people would like to select whichever option is applicable. And while we're talking about uh, legalities, um, if somebody contracted a COVID-19 in the workplace, um, would they have access to uh, apply for compensation in those circumstances? Uh, what are the legal obligations around contracting uh, COVID-19 at work? Bongi. <laughs> Um, I think I think the, the, the issue of uh, occupational disease would have to be uh, dealt with in terms of our current legislation. Um, of course, I, I think I think the uh, employers have got to make sure in terms of what is required of them to make sure that everything possible is done to make sure that the, uh, the uh, workplace is safe and uh, employees are safeguarded, are safeguarded from contracting any disease. Under those circumstances, you know, uh, in terms of what your, your workman's compensation, as, they, as it is called, uh, would have to be followed in terms of those, contract, those who have contracted the disease. I think though, uh, with, the, with the COVID-19, the employers got to probably even go an extra mile in terms of assisting the employee, uh, A, in terms of recovering, and making sure that he, the, he or she recovers, and also extended to probably to family members as well. Uh, regarding, uh, you know, uh, the assistance with, with training, uh, I mean, with the, with, the, with the screening and also testing where, wherever possible. But our current legislation, in my view, uh, would, would be sufficient to take uh, care of the occupational disease that arise from the workplace. It might be, it might be prudent as well for, for employers to look at if uh, there, is, it's, it's, there is any possibility of uh, ensuring some of the situations that we're currently facing. Um, of course, it's a cost involved, but it needs to be considered in moving, moving forward. I guess what I'm saying, our current legislation, legislation is there to really deal with occupational diseases currently. Thank you. Uh, Nigel, I see there's a question for you. Um, one of the people that is listening said, um, I did not understand your explanation about who should do the risk assessment, where and when should it be submitted? Perhaps you can just clarify that, uh, Nigel? Okay, the, yeah, so the risk assessment, uh, depending on the, um, the, the complexity of the, of the working environment, um, so the risk assessment should be carried out as, as soon as possible. 
Um, and essentially that sets up the framework, the foundation and the mechanisms of your mitigation and it would also bring about that, that induction training prior to entry into work. Um, from, from, the, um, from the legislation, it's, it's, it's the perspective, I'm just going to have a look at it here. Um, it's got to be submitted to the Department of Labor. It's got to be shared in conjunction and collaboration and in col collaboration with your health and safety committee um, and prior to commencing work. And that's a company only for those companies that are above 500. Those are um, so the companies that are above 500 have to submit it to the Department of Labor uh, accompanied with the with the policy. The companies that are below 500 and, and below, they would be still have to carry out a risk assessment and reevaluate it and adapt it to um, the actual working environment, um, to understanding and uh, putting those mechanisms of the controls now in, in place and um, continually up, updating it. Does that answer the question? We'll have to wait and see. Um... Whether that has been a satisfactory answer, I'm sure something will come up on the chat. In the meantime, perhaps we can share the results of our, our last poll. The poll was, uh, how would you rate your knowledge of legal requirements to comply with government's COVID-19 requirements or legislation? Uh, very few said excellent, only 8%, 15% said good. I'm still getting up to speed at 77%. Um, well, I'm glad to see that nobody after this uh, uh, webinar has got uh, non-existent knowledge. That's good news for uh, for the panelists. To an extent. Okay, so um, I think we're coming towards the end of our time. So I'm going to ask uh, Nigel. Do you have any final comments to make before we close? Um, yeah. Um, start with that planning initiative that we've um, spoken about in conjunction with the with the team and 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 the panelists. And the idea is to revisit and sustain, sustain, sustain. Um, those are the routines. Um, and the feeding back from the bottom down to the, to the top up. And, um, and essentially it's observing mm -hmm. and evaluating and, re, and um, re, actually re, it's reassessing. Um, yeah, thank you for the opportunity. Um, it's, it's been a good experience here. Yeah. Um, thank you. Before you go, there's another question for you. Um, it's from Craig DeFreitas. He says, we have a manufacturing process, light engineering, 11 staff members. We are operating turrets, leads, presses, etc., where oils and water are running through these machines. How many times in a day must we sanitize them? Um, is because some of those machines are shared um, and with what product? Um, yeah, so it makes it quite clear. Um, you can use soap, just, just we, we actually cannot disregard normal soap and water for 20 seconds. Um, um, but it, it does refer to the, it's the guidelines again, and it refers to a 70% alcohol-based sanitizer. Um, and other companies, are, they're actually stopping, they're establishing a bit of a routine um, where they stop um, every 10 minutes or every half an hour. So it's establishing those routines that are that are manageable within your workplace activities where um, a team, a team members can go and sanitize or go and wash, wash hands. Um, and, and that is one of the, um, uh, is, is actually one of the mantras that, that government is now actually pushing to ensure that basic hygiene standards are actually carry, carried out and, and would be maintained. And, and how many times a day would you do that? Um, that that is um, I've seen other companies they've established a protocol that is every every uh, ten minutes as far as I understand um, that they would basically go and sanitize their hands and then continue with their work which might seem quite extreme but that would be based on your on your risk and on the proximity of within in, like engaging with other workers so depending on the over of um, articles and um, and the cleanliness one could adopt it every half an hour but one would need to gauge that um, and to identify the um, it's the existing controls that that one would have um, in in the workplace so those are protocols that 
uh, that can reasonably um, be established and, and a routine. It's important to, when we say uh, frequently wash your hands, um, one would think three times a day would be adequate, but it's, it's, it's essentially by establishing those disciplines and, and those routines that it becomes now the, it's the standard or the norm. And, yeah. and that is an important criteria to, to, um, to actually adopt. Great, thank you. Um, I hope that's given some clarity. Uh, Bongi, Spangalisa has asked a question of you. Um, the issue of testing employees, um, is it necessary to test everyone in the company or only those who are showing symptoms? No, it's not necessary to test everybody in the company. It is necessary to screen everybody in the company, I suggest in every, every day, probably every morning when they come in. But only those who show signs uh, should, uh, should, be, should be tested, either by the company or through the uh, you know, government departments. No, it's not necessary. Only those who are showing signs. Fantastic. Thank you. And Bongi, have you got any last words uh, for the audience before we close? Just, just to say, uh, I think the uh, COVID-19 issues should be form a part of uh, uh, part of the agenda items of every meeting in the in the workplace, and it should be form part of our every day, every hour conversation, where we engage employees and discuss this thing as part of what we do. It needs to become of the second nature in terms of making sure that we are always aware. We're always preaching the same, uh, you know, issue in terms of what needs to be done uh, to defeat this particular sketch. So we need not, it needs to be on our radar screen all the time so that we can move forward and have a, you know, an improved and a deeper understanding as to what we need to do in the workplace or in our daily lives, in fact. Fantastic. Thank you very much to both of our panelists and for the innovation for, um, putting the session together. I hope that it's been valuable for the people that have attended. Thank you very much for inviting me. Um, honored to have been part of it. Um, and on that note, I'm gonna hand over to Lee uh, just to close the session. Lee, over to you. Thank you very much. Thanks to... ...were really insightful. Um, and I hope everybody found this valuable. I know I certainly found um, some of the lessons learned here incredibly valuable for our team. Uh, and I particularly hope our clients and anybody else who's um, paying attention to this webinar will be able to take something useful back to be able to protect their employees as well. So thank you everybody for that. Um, I think just an important point that stood out for me is the, the responsibilities lie on both the employer and the employee to protect one another right now. So I think that's something important for everybody to remember. And before I close, I'd just like to remind everybody uh, who's with us right now, uh, please sign up for our newsletter. You'll be able to keep updated with other interesting insights and we'll be hosting more of these webinars going forward. This is the first in a series. Uh, we'll also be having a training uh, or a few trainings depending on, dem on the demand with Nigel. So uh, again, you'll find out more on the newsletter or you can look at our website. And then lastly, this, um, this um, recording will be available on our YouTube channel um, uh, pretty soon in the near future as well. So uh, you can watch it back at any point um, and share it with anybody else that you think would find it valuable. So thank you everybody for your time. Thanks very much for joining thank us. You. Um, and we hope thank it was valuable for everyone. Thanks. Thanks, Lee. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank Stay. you, everybody. Thank you. Bye. Bye there.